Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. Welcome everyone to another, in this case highly anticipated, episode of Mirror Talks with Bentinho Massaro. This episode, The Relationship Fallacy, deconstructs one of the main pillars of human life as we know it, romantic relationships. This was a fun episode to record because Kelly and I got to learn a bit about Bentinho's romantic history and how, despite the wisdom and balance and non-attachment he displays now, he started out just like we did in many ways and had to overcome his own ideas and attachments bit by bit. The way he retraces his steps in this episode is surprisingly relatable. We also get into a timely topic that is not specific to relationships, victim consciousness, where it comes from, why it lasts, and how insidious it is. I highly encourage you to listen to that part without limiting it to the context of relationships or this episode. The last 30 or 40 minutes or so is where it all comes together. All three of us are connecting the dots and relating these concepts back to our own experience, dispelling the myth that being relationshipless is lonelier or more limited than the alternative. So it's another wonderful and possibly confronting conversation worth listening to start to finish, probably multiple times. Enjoy. Anything you've observed in um, either here, where we are, or in the world, or in some of your friends or social media? Mm -hmm. Nice. The topic that just keeps coming to mind, though I don't have any questions around it yet, is relationships. Oh, that topic. All right. I think I have an interesting view on relationships that is not that common. And it's, um, it's a view that has evolved over time, like very drastically for me, which is that why I think it might be interesting to people because yeah, I've, I've gone through all kinds of faces and, and different kinds of relationship settings and different kinds of dynamics. So I really feel in terms of my age being 30, what, two? two, being 32, I feel like I've really lived a very full human experimental life when it comes to relationships, so to speak, like lots of different kinds of nuances mm -hmm. and experiences and really going all the way into those details and explore and investigate and try different things and so forth. More so than the average person, I think, because people keep themselves bound to a more traditional paradigm. Um, or maybe they lack some of the courage to try out different settings or different things. Um, or maybe they're just in general shy and therefore things don't really happen with other people or whatever it is, or stuck in some kind of repeating pattern. So perhaps a little bit of um, just very short, and maybe we can harken back to my own personal history where needed. I will give um, a brief sort of summary of my history with relationships, my evolution with that, so that um, people kind of get an idea that I didn't just come to some kind of an idea or personal point of view about something, but this has really been evolved and investigated. I started off as your typical, overly intensely obsessed and devoted romantic nerd. Oh, sweetie. Oh. <laughs> such a cute way to put it. So I would, I remember like from early age, I was like this major romantic, like sad, like, but you know, sweet. In um, like even elementary school, there's this gypsy girl and 
she was in like a different class or something. And I was like five, six years old. And I was just like head over heels, like mm. obsessed. Like every time she would like walk on the playground of the school. And my mom held like buy present for her and all that stuff. Um, and anyway, this, I was in love with her maybe for two years or so, like at that age, even never successful or anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't get it in? <laughs> what? Corey, come on. <laughs> Proceed. Unsuccessful at love from five to seven. <laughs> so anyway, uh, jump forward a few years. So my first few relationships, um, or whatever kind of was like a relationship at the time, around maybe 14, 15, 16 years old. Um, for the most part, I would just scare, if, the, if I was really crazy about them, I would just scare them away. Because I was so intense. I was so kind of like obsessed, like I made the whole thing, like everything about them and stuff. And to some people that sounds appealing in their later age. But if you're 16 years old, and you're, you're grown, you just want to ex explore and experiment and you go out and you go whatever you do drugs or something like that. Um, then you know, that is, it feels a little sticky, obviously. So the typical sort of like clingy and overly like obsessed, um, protective, um, claimy kind of energy. Mm -hmm. That kind of matured into just sort of, um, yeah, devotional, like all or nothing kind of face, where it would still have that intensity, would still have that obsession but without the sort of same level of clinginess and maturity. But nevertheless, like, internally, like my heart would, would bleed out in their direction the whole time, basically, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So your typical sort of foolish romantic, like for a long time, most most part of my, um, I guess most part of my life. Wait, yeah, maybe. Anyway. And I'm just curious, did you get broken up with? Or did you do the breaking up? in these situations? Um, uh, they would typically do breaking up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In that sort of first half of my relationship experience life. So at some point I had a, I had a partner. That was my first real, I would consider that girlfriend uh, for about three years. We lived together. Um, I met her at like this yoga meditation retreat that I went to, I was 17 or 18, I think she was like 27. Hmm. Um, I was still virgin at this point. And because it was good at being in the red zone. <laughs> and so we got together, there was like a really nice connection there, like, there was a spiritual bond, so to speak, it was like some kind of recognition. Um, so we tried that for quite some time and it was quite beautiful. But so for three years, we lived together, we had a couple cats, uh, you know, we did our nine to five job kind of thing. So it was really kind of that typical nine to five situation, sort of the pre family kind of setup, if you right. will. Mm -hmm. But I was, um, yeah, I, I was just like kind of too young, I think for her. And like, I had sort of other ambitions also with my, just my soul searching and my intensity of seeking enlightenment and stuff. Anyway, like I was in an intense phase of seeking, like intense seeking for enlightenment. So as some people may know, that's not the most uh, practical nine to five, like, are you ready for a child kind of setup, right? It's more like uh, a late teenager trying to figure out who the hell they are, and like giving that search, giving everything to that search. And that was always more important to me in the end, that was always more important to me than any kind of relationship, although mm. it did kind of... Uh, because of that sort of the remnants of that foolish, romantic, overly devotional, romanticizing relationships and, and women and partnership and being committed and like all the romantic ideas I had about that. Uh, it did kind of was a contester, contender, 
contender contender for a while. So wow. anyway, I'm happy that she ended things. But it did devastate me for quite some time. Um, even though this was already after I had my initial sort of awakening in India, where I kind of found what I was looking for um, in terms of enlightenment mm -hmm. or spirituality. But then there was a, a pretty intense sort of readjustment period of like trying to put things in perspective and dealing with the remnants of my human psychology, it both in response to that sort of awakening um, and then also in response to like how that sort of rubber meets the road of everyday life and like all the strong uh, uh, emotions and thoughts and intensities and obsessions and whatever such as relationships. So when she ended things, it was kind of abrupt for me. This was a really good period in my life. Like I didn't think that at the time, but basically overnight, um, it kind of came to light. She was with some other person. And at that time, that was, for me, that was like the worst. Like my, my biggest fears in life were, um, and it's just funny thinking back at this, but like really my biggest fears, like bigger than fear of my own death um, or anything else I could have imagined is either my partner dying or that she would leave me or that she would cheat on me. So, and now that sounds ridiculous to me, especially the last one. Like if she would cheat on me, it's like, because in my mind, that doesn't even exist anymore, cheating on someone. And I'll get to why. So so it's had a, this long evolving curve, basically, to get to where I'm at today, which has been due to the process of uh, getting through, working through my biases and um, just basically seeing into the truth of things rather than projecting this biased conditioned perspective that we have of things that causes so much suffering and causes so much non-clarity between two people and non-communication and so forth. All right, so she broke up with me and then overnight, um, I lost there for my house because it was her house. So, and she lived on the other side of the country for my parents, which was kind of my only option at the time. So I lost my relationship overnight. I lost my relationship uh, and I, I heard that part of it was about cheating, or I overheard that cheating had been taking place without my knowledge. So that stung a little bit. Then I mm. had to move to my parents' place in this farmer's village, like in the middle of nowhere on the edge of the country, like moving from a, a sub city close to Amsterdam to this. Um, I didn't have my job because my job was local, like a cashier thing or something. And and my cats, which I was quite attached to. So I lost my girlfriend, my cats, my job, my location, and my proximity to friends. So here I was back with my parents. Mm. And again, like I said, this is perfect, but this really, this really sort of threw me for a loop and into, um, into my first sort of familiarity with depression. Um, and I had, I had a s sort of a depressive face in India but it was more an angst. It was more sort of an existential angst and a fear and kind of a PTSD generated by mm. some of the health situations that we had there and all that stuff. So I wasn't entirely happy in India, even though I kind of found what I was looking for, but it wasn't all like bliss and sunshine from that point on where it was like a strong integration period and sort of a rude awakening period, which I think a lot of people relate to um, post sort of initial awakening. So I came back from India, lived together for a while longer, then this breakup happened. And there I was with my parents, nothing to do, uh, no one to see. Basically, there's nothing and like a situation that I did not prefer. So plenty of time to churn over, like the relationship loss and the heartbreak and like tell myself the story is over and over again. And, um, and that's actually where my awakening sort of deepened, where it wasn't just an awakening, like, oh, this is what's here. This, this pure free awareness is what's here. And it's accessible. Now what deepened was, and you have the choice to shift into that or not. And if you choose it, your suffering is relieved. If you don't choose it, your suffering intensifies. So I was placing myself from a higher self point of view, I was forcing myself into a situation where which is what I really wanted at a higher level. Mm -hmm. I wanted to master this teaching. I wanted to master this realization. So perfect opportunity to choose to 
um, yeah, kind of a fork in the road, like either like hell in your own psychology or total freedom. And that's really where I also started sharing some of the videos that ended up on YouTube and stuff like the bliss video yeah. that got me kind of known back in the day and uh, got me invited to the United States to share my experience and stuff. But that was really the crucible for me, like where the rubber meets the road. And that gave me sort of this monastic experience to really apply the awakening to my psycho psychological experience, my thoughts, my emotions, my everyday life, my hopelessness, my depression, and so forth. So it was a great um, year or two or so of practice. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I say like, uh, one of the most valuable times in my life. You know, one of the reasons why, even though it's still, you know, just part of my heart, like when you see someone suffering, it's like, part of me, like the human part of me wishes she wouldn't have to go through this. But there's this bigger, more realized part of me that it's often even rejoiced when it recognizes how someone is putting themselves in a situation where they get to learn exactly what they want to learn at a higher level. Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's this compassion, but this compassion is balanced with the wisdom, understanding that they're totally guided by their higher selves, they can totally handle that situation, otherwise they wouldn't create it. And that actually, mm -hmm. this is in their best interest. So it's this dual perspective that you hold, right, as sort of a shepherd or someone who cares and can see beyond their own bubble, at least to some degree, you start to then really care about other people. And then your heart goes out to them when you see them suffering, because it feels like your own pain also, if you're especially if you're very sensitive. But then to have the courage to hold that sensitivity, both for your own circumstances, as well as when you're projecting it onto others, in the light of that greater wisdom, that meta perspective, of knowing that everything is perfectly guided, and that they are creating this for themselves, and that you don't have the right to change that for them. You can offer information, you can educate, you can be your own example and share what that is like. But it is up to them, whether or not they're ready to implement that change, or whether that just plants a seed that they can grow later on when they're ready. So, and that's because I've gone through so many periods like that, that I didn't, that were so seemed so destructive at the time, and that I absolutely resented and felt like hell. But that turned out to be exactly what I wanted to create for myself. And without them, I would not be here able to say these things that I'm saying today, and I wouldn't be where I am, and so forth. I mean, kind of cliche, we all know that like, our past pains typically turn out to be um, our greatest allies, if we take some ownership, and we're not in a total victim state, like you were saying, mm -hmm. during the other session. So once we take ownership of the fact that we create our own reality, including our pains and our challenges and our crucible periods, then typically we can use it to our advantage. And we become really grateful for it after some time after the healing and the integration and the lessons have been learned and so forth. So what I really noticed at that crossroads or the the fork in the road moment where I had this choice, like, okay, human suffering, or total freedom, human suffering or total freedom. What I really realized was as I was in some of my most intense, depressive, like hopeless, I wouldn't say suicidal, because I didn't really think about suicide it wasn't really anything I would ever really consider as an option. But it is similar to that mm -hmm. state where you just you see no hope, you see no way out, you don't want to live, you don't want nothing seems fun. And again, the paradox of that and my awakening, which and I was aware of this paradox, I was like, how can I feel this intensely depressed and hopeless, when I actually did find what I was looking for in India, or at least the beginnings of it. Mm -hmm. So but at some point, the pain got so big, for me anyway, perceived pain, that it only left me with one choice, which was to look away from it for just a moment. So I did. I was like, wait a second, over here in my consciousness, I almost started to give it a location. I started to, I didn't start to separate it or segregate it, like people do with like multiple personalities, for example, where they avoid it, and they push it away to suppress it, they don't want to see it. Because I was investigating it. I, it's not that I didn't want to see it, but it's like, it became so overwhelmingly depressive, and non functional, like debilitating, non effective, and I realized it was non effective. And but suddenly what opened up to me um, was 
this sense of all my suffering, this intense suffering, this hell that I'm creating in my own mind, and I was aware that it was in my own mind. Because I looked, I would look around and I was like, I'm perfectly fine. I'm just, I'm in this actually very nice house in Holland, uh, uh, next to a forest with a swimming pool. Um, and yes, there's nobody around here that I want to talk to. But, but physically, like, I'm actually quite okay. I'm actually quite okay. So I could see that objectively, but, oh, I would get swept in into those like strong currents of like depression and like victim and feelings and like, oh, mm -hmm. hopelessness. So I noticed that that all sort of had a location, for lack of a better word. It's like I could identify it as being over here, filling my mind. And I noticed that if I looked over there, wherever there was, it was like a clear blue sky. It's like, wait a second, if I look at this story and at this pain and at this psychological drama, at this point, I've created so much momentum in these thoughts, and I've changed so many memories together into this sort of pain experience. But if I look, and so that if I look at that, I get swallowed up by it, and it's non productive. It's not a productive way to experience or get to know my suffering and myself. If I look over there, if I look away from that sort of location within my consciousness where the suffering was taking place, there wasn't any of that. <laughs> so I had this sort of hell and heaven contrast, or at least hell and clear skies, or emptiness, or um, non-suffering, or peace. It's like, whoa, holy fuck. I can look over here, and it's like, almost like dead quiet. And there's wow. this clarity, and there's this sort of sky-like awareness. Or I can look over, focus over here, and immediately feel all my bodies and energies go like, whoa, collapse into this debilitating state where I don't want to get out of bed and do anything whatsoever. So then I started pivoting, started going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until it became easier. So it was like more consistent. And it's like, until that started to become blissful. Not only in contrast to the suffering was it blissful, because any type of relief, right? That's why people do drugs, because it's blissful in comparison to their emotional state, which they can't seem to deal with, or any type of substance or any type of avoidance. But again, I wasn't really avoiding it. I was trying to figure out a way to deal with it, to cope with it. So again, it's not like I suppressed it, which is not what I recommend to anyone, to suppress their emotional state, or to deny it, or to shove it under the rug, so to speak. I was attempting to find a way out of it, a productive way out of this debilitating cycle that I couldn't get out of if I just kept doing the same thing. So I noticed this open sky like awareness contrast to this area of my consciousness, so to speak. And again, I started pivoting, pivoting, pivoting. And so it became blissful, both in contrast to the suffering not being there when I put my focus there, and also in just the realization that I have the option to not suffer if I want to. Mm -hmm. So the realization of empowerment in that enlightenment, meaning I'm empowered to choose enlightenment over debilitating depression, that's within my power. That's very empowering to know that going forward in your life, no matter what happens, no matter how bad it gets for you in your own thinking or in your situation, that actually you still have the choice, even, even at the very bottom of your experience, you have the choice to focus on that experience or to focus on something else. And in this case, that's not something to try to replace that with. It's just an alternate state of focus where you're aware of what I would call your truer self, or your more expanded state of consciousness. And just pivoting back and forth gave me that sense of empowerment. And this was still appealing at the time. There was a lot of momentum in that. So it took some courage. It took some consistency. It took some being really sick of being sick, right? As the Tao Te Ching says, you can only heal or be healed if you're truly sick of being sick. Mm. So it it's tempting for us to go into our suffering like that when it's like so depressing and when it's victimizing, because then we can feel the gratification of being a victim and being somebody at least that's mm. like, that's been wronged or that doesn't get what it wants or God hates me or whatever it is. And so 
it's tempting to go in that direction. So therefore, it takes courage, combination of courage and getting so exhausted with that, to the point of where you're done believing in your own thoughts, you're done believing in your own right to suffer, so to speak, mm -hmm. your own choice to suffer, you're so done with it. And then you begin to see it, there's another option, I could choose not to suffer about this. So that was greatly liberating for me. Damn, and then you have that muscle built for anything ever in the future. Right, once you've been through the crucible, you can never sort of undo that yeah. empowerment. The empowerment to choose enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Once you know that you are empowered at any point to choose enlightenment, to choose the more awake state of consciousness, to recognize that sky-like background of pure being and awareness, that spaciousness, then life becomes a whole different ballgame, and you become way less afraid of suffering, much more able to handle it, to witness it, to investigate it, to let it go, to process it, however you need to. Because you have this unending support of your true self, mm -hmm. this unending support of your ability to shift your consciousness into different sort of states of self awareness. So at this point, I was maybe 20 or so, I think. Um, and not only was it like I was saying, it was not only blissful in contrast to the suffering, it was not only liberating in contrast to the suffering. And it was not only liberating because I realized I have choice in the matter. It was also blissful because awareness is blissful. The actual taste of the direct experience of the background of awareness, when sufficiently chosen, is actually blissful. So yeah, anyway, I started to I started to pivot back and forth between absolute hell and depression and total freedom and joy and bliss. And and just observe the paradox for a while as I practice this, like wow, like the contrast, like mm -hmm. day and night, hell and heaven. That obviously inspired me to I mean, it has its own gravitational effect that kind of pulls you out of that spell of depression, it starts to break the chain, it starts to break the attachment to the story, the addiction, because now you have something else to look for. The reason why we perpetuate our stories and continue to focus down into that endless loop of suffering and intensify it is because we believe there is some benefit or liberation to be gained inside the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, oh, if she wouldn't have cheated on me, uh, or maybe if I make one more last super romantic move, mm -hmm. or da, 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 there's like all these kinds of hope mm -hmm. projections that keep you bound to that story, keep you bound to that cycle of energetic momentum. And at some point, that momentum gets so convoluted and intense and strong that there's no reason to it anymore. There's no logic to it anymore. There's no, it's just a hopeless state of just mm -hmm. negative energy cycle, like a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. So now, now I was back on quite rapidly, I would say I was back on a positive spiral, like an upward spiraling energy. Because of this sort of breaking of the chain of the story, like many times to doop, doop, just break the story, Oh, I noticed myself, ooh, like go down, like, and in a second, I would be from the blue sky, blue sky of awareness, uh, the wide open blue sky of awareness to like, boom, like back to gra fully engulfed in the gravity of of this debilitating depression. And it just baffled me, like, how can I feel so free and spacious, and then boom, mm -hmm. so dense, and so limited, and like a heavy block of ice, then turning back to vapor, then back to ice, then back to vapor, then back to ice, almost with no, no seconds in between. But that really put this in such a stark contrast for me, that my faith in this practice increased so much. I think it's crazy and, that you took that the whole time you took 100% responsibility. That, like you, you didn't blame, like if you had any thought that there was blame, external blame, you would have been pulled out into the story. Like, but for you to continually keep taking responsibility feels like, how did you even know that or learn that? Like, nobody really says that that it's all your responsibility? Like, where would you get that? So I wouldn't say that that was my constant experience, especially at first, there were victimization stories. But I had already been exposed to sort of personal development trainings. And like, I would go to weekend seminars, or like week long intensives, 
mm. um, that would train you in sort of the basics of NLP and and some meditation mm. and uh, personal development and empowerment. I did that from the age of 10 through the age of 17 or so. So I had a foundation in empowerment. I had a foundation oh, wow. in knowing oh, that I can so change cool. my thoughts. And so, yep. so I was very aware of my victim stories. Um, but doesn't mean they were not appealing to me. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, but I was aware, at least, that it was a choice mm -hmm. at some level. So I think that's nice. the foundation mm -hmm. that gave me that ability. And to be aware it's a story in the first place is a massive advantage over it. Yes. Which in my later years, like 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, you know, I had been studying some of the scriptures, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, Advaita Vedanta, um, uh, Dzogchen. So I had this enlightenment, I had this enlightenment vocabulary backed up with some direct experience of my own awakenings and so forth. So plus all the personal development that preceded that, so I already had a strong foundation of, of being wired towards taking ownership of my experience in that sense, and knowing that I create that and that I have choice and freedom. So I couldn't fully believe in my story. Uh, or I couldn't fully believe that I was a victim, although it was so it was so apparent, like, I, I did believe I was a victim at one level, but there was this sort of additional observer quality that I've kind of always had ever even before my trainings but also because the training side had that foundation of knowledge. So then I started to get really sucked into this, this other choice of like freedom. And this sort of sucked me in so rapidly that I couldn't find a trace of my suffering or story. I couldn't find any resentment towards this ex-girlfriend or like sense of loss anymore after like, I, I don't, I really don't know how long that took, but I want to say a matter of two or three weeks, something like that, where it no longer hurt when it had the thoughts. Yeah. I mean, from debilitating depression to like total freedom from believing in that story in about two or three weeks using this pivoting practice. So even if you went into the story or whatever, it like didn't exist. Yeah. It didn't seem sensible. Wow. It didn't seem it like seemed empty, like a dream, like a dream you remember that you had a year ago, there's wow. no connection to it. Uh, maybe I don't quite remember, I'm hy hypothesizing, maybe if I really went deeply into it, I could still feel some remnants of it. Mm -hmm. If I really started to return the thoughts and because if we continue to return the thoughts, and we're not breaking the chain repeatedly, and for days, we start turning, then we start turning back into ice, our vibration slows mm -hmm. down. And we again become victim of our stories, right? But I didn't have any reason to do that. And there was a positive momentum in more and more awakening, more and more bliss. And that's really when I started making those sort of handheld videos uh, that um, that really appealed to people at the time, because the spontaneity, because of my youthfulness, and you could just feel that I was in bliss when I made the video about bliss. And so people are like, hey, who is this young kid? And mm -hmm. walking in like farmlands in Holland, like making handheld videos of like bliss and non-dual awareness and stuff like that. So then I got invited to the United States to, to, sh to share. And um, so that's kind of where my public uh, teaching, uh, I wouldn't call it career, but like activity <laughs> uh, <laughs> begin, if you will. So anyway, next girlfriend. Yep, exactly. I, I don't want to get lost in all the details. And also like, the, the more I return to the present moment, the more those people may be known mm -hmm. uh, to some other people right. that are listening to this. And I don't, I don't want to involve their names or, or give any mm -hmm. clear idea of who they are nice. uh, for their own privacy and such. So I'm going to keep it very general at this point, and um, kind of gloss over a lot of detail. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of depth to each of these stories, because it was super intense with anything I would engage in. Mm -hmm. um, that would be super observant, super attentive, super trying to figure out the best way to do things and interact with things. And there was a lot, of, I can say there was a lot of sincerity in each of my relationships. Um, 
whether or not that was their perception. I can honestly say I've been super attentive and, and caring and like to the detail to a degree that they could simply not perceive. And so because of that attentiveness and that ability to observe and learn and digest and make a lot of mistakes, um, I extracted a lot of learning from that in a short amount of time, relatively short amount of time. To me, it f it's felt like ages, this whole relationship trajectory of like, whatever, from the age of maybe 14 till when it really became relevant type of Although like before that too, I processed from the age of six or seven, I processed intense emotions around relationships. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. been for really the majority of my life that this has been a, a theme for me to explore and get to the bottom of. I tried all kinds of configurations after this. I've been married. Um, I proposed on my second date. <laughs> <laughs> I still had, even after all this, I still had this romantic side. I still have it today. Like mm -hmm. it's still an aspect of me that I, I appreciate and I cherish it, but it's no longer able to fool me in the ways that it used to. It got me into a lot of trouble, emotional trouble for myself, and like put me on all kinds of cycles and spins and sort of karmic things that needed alleviating and like da da da. da. So now I've wisened up, and I say this with the humility, <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> I might fall flat on my face again, who knows? But it seems very unlikely because of my current state of consciousness. Mm -hmm and everything that I've processed through these relationships. So by the way, massive thank you. If any of my ex-girlfriends are watching this, I love you. <laughs> thanks for all the lessons. And thanks for putting up with my intensity. Um, so marriage, divorce, um, open relationships, relationship with two women at the same time, that was openly sort of almost like a tripod, um, tripod experience or two without any relationship agreements or structures. Um, like I said, open relationships, like just multiple, like whatever, whatever arises uh, as relevant. Um, uh, solo relationship, committed relationship, even after those experiments and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I've gone back and forth and and tried all kinds of modalities. Not like I was like, okay, let's try this because this isn't working. It's just kind of a nat natural evolution. Like, oh, now this was presented to me and it seemed like the most relevant resonant configuration. And I was open to it. I had my challenges about it. I had my ideas to let go about it. I had my ideas about what others would think about it to let go of it, especially being a public person and wanting to make sure this message <laughs> um, remains respected to the degree where people that want to benefit from it will benefit from it and they're not scared away by like bad media and that kind of stuff. Anyhow, so I've tried all these different configurations. Um, I've been with several women that had an intense victim state consciousness also. Like I, f I feel like for this life, I wanted to really, as part of helping me in sort of my role as a messenger or teacher, I wanted to really get to the bottom of this victim consciousness or experience it firsthand. And the self abuse that people apply to themselves without realizing it, and the abuse that they'll place onto others, in this case, me. Uh, and just the sheer degree of, of non logic and nonsense, nonsense, of the walls that are up for people with a strong victim consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I've just, I've, I've, I've tried everything that I could possibly think of um, the, in the realm of like love and care and, and, and attempting to make things work and help and support. Nothing works, just nothing works. Uh, in, in extreme cases, nothing works. It, do, it doesn't matter. Wow. It doesn't matter what you do. Mm. I remember the first time, and this was quite early on, like I was younger, early 20s. I was with this woman for a while who she, still to this date, and I've, I've, I've been with other women who have a strong victim consciousness since then. But to this date, that was the most extreme case that really shook me up that really woke me up to, to the horrific nature of victim consciousness. Um, 
to the point where there were separate personalities and apps absolutely no ability to let any kind of truth in anything would get instantly distorted and it's like you're talking to a program um, and it's painful because you love the entity you love the being and you want to be of service but it doesn't it doesn't matter what you do you can surrender to their stories you can admit whatever they claim is happening uh, even if it, you know reasonably it's not at all true you can try to fight it you can try to just be quiet and let it be you can offer love gentleness you can try some tough love and some suggestions you can try to teach you can try not to teach um you can try to touch you can try not to touch it doesn't matter it it is hell bound on distorting whatever it is wow and you see this in a lot of human beings and this is why i'm sharing this mm. because and you see this in groups too subgroups that reinforces itself because one of the things the victim consciousness needs to do is constantly validate its its point of view as a victim, its position as a victim. It's become so addicted to the momentum of that wicked form of self-gratification, where their existence is confirmed. A glimmer of their own sense of self-worth is confirmed by being the victim. Because if you're the victim, you're in the spotlights. If you're in the victim, you're right. If you're in the victim, you're loved. It's a completely twisted game, and it hurts the person who is believing in it the most. And it's also causing a lot of psychological harm and manipulation. But what baffled me was the degree to which that person and those people that I've met that are along those lines of that state of consciousness, that way of seeing things, the degree to which there's a completely oblivious of what they're doing. At that point, I realized like I can, there's nothing I can do. There's literally nothing. I, I tried everything I could possibly think of to the point of exhaustion, and there's nothing. And I was just looking at this mm. lovely being destroy herself in her own mind, you know, laying on the toilet floor, just like bawling, crying, like, and, and I realized there's actually, there's nothing I could do for you. I, all I could do is throw my life away and stop sharing this message and devote every second to listening to your stories. Um, and even that wouldn't really lead anywhere productive. And then I wouldn't be able to do what I feel I need to do. So I've got to, it was hard for me because I never want to break up. I have this thing against breaking up. Mm -hmm. It's been, it's always been, um, I don't know, like, I just, I don't believe in breaking up somehow. I don't, because it's, Mm -hmm. But that's why also today I don't believe in relationships, because I don't believe in getting on either. Nice. But I don't believe in breaking up. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> long story, mm -hmm. long context. So about the victim, have you have you seen anything ever work even outside of relationships in terms of curing victim consciousness? I saw one moment with this person. Um, she was aware of spirituality and such. Uh, and non-duality. She's aware of my teachings as well and all that. And at some point I read something to her um, on her birthday, actually. It was very beautiful. I read something to her from Ramana Maharshi because she was asserting something, some kind of a state of consciousness. And uh, I could see through that, the fact that it was just a mental loop. It wasn't, it wasn't a true sense of freedom. So this quote came to mind. So I figured I'm not going to try to preach or teach because that doesn't work. I'm just going to read this quote. I just want to read this quote for your birthday. So I read this quote by Ramana Maharshi. I forgot what quote it was. And as I read, something clicked in for her. And she had the actual awareness shift wow. that she had mm -hmm. been talking about. And suddenly, her whole persona dropped away. And she saw herself. And there was no resistance. And she just got the most beautiful giggle come over her and she just could not stop giggling and laughing. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh my God. And just like the whole victim consciousness was gone. And there was a, a true proper state of enlightenment. And I was just like delighted at the sight of this. It was very beautiful, very beautiful. And the next day, no memory of it. What? You can remember it? You brought it back up and she... Couldn't remember it? Um, in sort of a vague way, 
but like totally dismissed, I guess. No, oh, what? Like virtually forgotten. Yes, like it basically it never happened. Like she had been drunk, as if she had been drunk. Almost as if she'd been drunk to the point of passing out. Yeah. Wow. wow. And and that that's the nature. Like and I, like I'm saying that's an extreme case with sort of borderline or multiple personality disorder and stuff, um, where it's been so segregated. Uh, you know, people that have been like abused and stuff by their parents and all that, they, they can get that kind of, um, well, anyone can get that type of victimization given the right circumstances and thought forms and conditioning. But that just was such a teacher for me. Like, how can someone have such a profound awakening experience? And the whole energy shifted. Like, it was gorgeous. Like, she was, she was completely different. Boom. Like, the whole room was radiating. She was beaming. Boom. Boom. No stories. And the rest of the time, it was all stories. Oh, did that, did this, and that person, and that, and that, constantly. And then it was like, boom. And just this radiant light coming through her. And she just had to laugh and giggle at every thought that came up for herself. And then she slept, she woke up, and it was like nothing ever happened or changed. Mm -hmm. So that's also when I realized, like, no, I, I can't do anything. Like, I can't help. You cannot help another person. They can only truly be ready for it themselves. And um, yeah, and the longer you engage with that kind of consciousness, you, in a very intimate way, trying to help, the more you just kind of like exert yourself and like, it's a wasted energy in the end. Um, because it will inevitably also turn against you, like it will just, the way that the victim consciousness uses memory, is that it continues to repeat events from the past. And then you get you play this telephone game with yourself, basically, if you have a strong victim orientation in your consciousness, you know, the telephone game, right, I tell you a word, you pass it on to the next person, da da da. Mm. And after like 10 people, the word is completely different. Chinese whispers, Chinese whispers. Mm -hmm. right. That's what it's called. That's what victims are doing with memory, and facts and events in their own consciousness. That's why they think they're right because they heard this word. But they told themselves this story over and over again, every time, slightly, sometimes radically distorting the event that actually occurred, or the thing that was actually shared or said, or whatever it is. They have to, in order to corroborate, to create this whole mm -hmm. um, conspiracy theory of the world against me, the victim, because I'm unworthy, in order to feel some glimmer of worthiness and attention and love, I need to be center stage victim of my own story. And the only way I can do that is to distort every kind thing everyone ever did to me and, and make myself superior to that and make myself in a righteous position as the victim. Um, so also to see how, how some of the people that I've experienced being close to, how they have the ability to distort data and not be factual with events and not actually not remember. That was another shocking thing to me, just like she didn't remember the profound experience she had the night before, mm. like it never happened. Also, the details of occurrences in the past, the more time passes, and the more they repeat the story, which they do, because they're addicted to that story, it's a painful process, but or it's a painful fact, but they're addicted to that story. Because again, they need to corroborate, they need to substantiate their position as the victim. It's self reinforcing. That's that's their main mission of that type of consciousness that believe. Every time they tell that story, more distortion gets added. But they don't realize that's happening. They actually believe that what they're thinking and memorizing, that their interpretation is how it actually happened. So that can be completely distorted. And all your well intended actions, in this case, as a partner, will get distorted over time, the stronger the victim consciousness, the faster that happens, it can happen in a matter of days, or it can happen over the time span of a year, which is especially dangerous, because so much will be added to that story by then. And there's no relationship anymore to who you are as as whether it's their partner or their teacher or their parent or their brother or it doesn't matter. Or yeah, any type of relationship, really, that they have they have only a relationship to their mission, which is to prove that they're victims and that they're unworthy. It's very painful. And you want nothing more but to break that spell for them, you want nothing more but to help them realize their worth and their freedom. Um, but no matter how much love you pour into that, 
is it gonna rebound as hatred mm -hmm. and 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 betrayal and stories and also all sorts of things. So um and I've experienced repeating cycles of that kind of to face my my own sort of sense of romantic notions as well of like commitment and like martyrdom and stuff like that. Mm. Um so I needed kind of for my own lessons, I needed that sense of like the betrayal or not being seen accurately or not being received accurately consistently to kind of learn so much about myself, but also learn so much about how to be a public person, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And like, there's so many lessons and all that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I've also had really beautiful connections and relationships. And even with those who had a strong victim consciousness, there's been amazing moments like it's shared. So um, it's not like it's all bad or abusive, but I mean, it is uh, something to take note of this victim consciousness, because it is running rampant in the world, at least to some degree, mm -hmm. most people have it. Um, and I've had it. So it's something to uproot, and it's something to bring awareness into and to liberate ourselves from and to take ownership of. Um, so through all kinds of journey with relationships at great intensity, rapid speed, like I've not been alone for a lot of my life, like, um, since the age of my first partner, there's almost always been some kind of relationship, some kind of like intense, uh, teaching, learning, learning, teaching type of dynamic with a partner relationship, whatever. And I didn't seem to need a lot of time to recuperate. Also, it's like, even if I had like, been shocked. It's like, once it's sort of over, uh, for the most part, the healing has been very quick for me. Mm -hmm. And the re recuperation has been very quick for me. Because even while it was happening, my own suffering and the dynamic I could hold in this light, uh, because of my practice with this state of freedom, the state of pure consciousness. And so that's always been with me for, you know, the last decade or so. And that really, really greatly helps in healing and in understanding what's happening, understanding our own choices, why we suffer, why we choose to continue to suffer, why we choose to continue to help those who don't want to be helped, why we do whatever we do, and why there's the responses that come and stuff is just a greatly heightened awareness and a sense of freedom throughout all of it, a sense of acceptance throughout all of it. So I typically didn't need a lot of time to sort of reset myself or be by myself. Would it have been helpful? Yeah, maybe to some degree, but I didn't need it, didn't feel like I needed it. Uh, typically, I was ready for more processing, ready for more dynamics, ready for more learning, ready for more mm -hmm. journeys. Um, again, because this intensity to learn, this intensity to get to the bottom of things, to understand things, to master every element of my consciousness, every shadow, every aspect, every to integrate everything, to balance everything. It's not until fairly recently that I have come to sort of the natural conclusion that no relationship is best for me personally, uh, with no insistence upon that as a form or structure. It's just kind of a, a seeing a clarity that has dawned throughout all those experiences is the illusory and uh, destructive nature of the concept of relationship. So my my claim at this stage is relationships don't exist. There is no such thing as a relationship. It's a complete figment of our imagination. It's a complete story. It's just an agreement. That's why, like I said previously, now it's silly to me to think of why one of my biggest fear used to be my girlfriend cheating on me. I just have to giggle at that. Like that seems so nerdy. That okay. seems so silly. Uh, with all due respect to those who still believe that is possible. But I have been cheated upon several times. And at the time, it seemed like a real experience. And now it's like, that's not possible. How can someone cheat on you? It's just not possible. Just we can start with that as an entrance point into mm -hmm. no relationship being relationships don't exist. They're just agreements. And for the most part, they're agreements to and I'd be curious to find exceptions to this, if you guys know of any exceptions. But typically, relationship means 
I agree to not do this and this and this and this and that. If you agree to not do this and this and this and this and that, because if you don't do this and this and this and this and that, if you stay within these parameters, within this, these confines that I've set up for you, that you agree to and I agree to, then I can continue to feel safe within my victim state, within my disempowered state of knowing myself, and you can continue to feel safe. So basically, I like the way you look. We have a nice connection. And there's energy between us being exchanged. There's some potency. There's some maybe sexual energy exchange. There's a, a, a sense of love and peace with when we're with each other and joy and whatever. At, and in the best case scenario, that's the case, right? Mm -hmm. Typically, it's even more intellectual than that for a lot of people. But so, in order to make sure that I have this all the time and I don't have to worry about my insecurities, you promise not to do these things. And I promise not to do these things. If you do do those things, you're cheating on me. First of all, this is completely based on the concept that you can own another person, that you can mm -hmm. own an entity. Relationships don't exist because ownership doesn't exist. And free will is paramount. So I wouldn't even want to confine someone in that way. At this stage, at this point, I wouldn't want someone to have any limitations if they meet someone else that they fall head over heels in love with, or, or even just it feels like a, a one time kind of energetic healing experience or exchange or a sexual energy exchange. Uh, if that feels truly resonant and relevant for whoever I'm with and committing some time and energy to, then that should be an avenue that's kept free, because that's what is inspired in them. So someone cannot cheat on me unless I can own them, right? Mm -hmm. But I can't own them. I can agree to all kinds of things and shit and bullshit and nonsense and ideas, and they can agree to all kinds of ideas, all to sort of like, call under the name, under the banner of love, justify that I'm using you to not have to look at my sense of fundamental, fundamentally being afraid to die, to be left alone, to, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So my insecurities, uh, you're going to be the, the cover up. Mm -hmm. You're going to be my partner, we're going to be in a relationship, you're not going to do this and this and that you're going to just love me, I'm going to love you. And in that exchange, I'm going to feel safe. And I won't have to look at my insecurities until maybe there comes a point where you have to leave or you die, or you join the military, and you have to go overseas for two years, or whatever it is, then we'll deal with it then. But that's why we fear these things so much too. we fear our partner dying, and we fear our partner leaving, and we fear our partner cheating, because they are our cover up. They are the rug underneath which we shove our insecurity. Mm -hmm. That's not love. I understand people do it because I've done it. I understand the intensity of that fear, because it used to be my biggest fear. Uh, it doesn't make it loving. It has nothing to do with love. So relationship is the anti it's uh, the Satan to love. Um, but we call it love, Satan wears many disguises, right? So, uh, and the Antichrist of love <laughs> is relationship. And I'll just make that statement, not as sort of an extreme point of view that people should hold on to, it's just kind of to be provocative, and to kind of get the message across of what I'm trying to convey here, is that a relationship is, if you look at it objectively, without your subjective feelings. What is it? It's an agreement. It's a contract. Mm -hmm. Signed a dotted line. And if you don't, you're breaking the contract, aka you're cheating on me. Or you're betraying me. I would love for someone to try to change my mind. But how is that different from all the other contracts that are relatively real, like buying a house or signing a work contract? Well, we call this one love. We say, I love you, but don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't feel that, don't think this, don't look over there. Right. Because I own you. And therefore, I feel safe in that illusion. And if you agree to that, I'm going to love you. And if you don't, I'm going to be really upset at you. Mm -hmm. It's just child's play. Relationships mm -hmm. are the very sign of spiritual immaturity. <laughs> <laughs> Like everyone on earth has it. Everyone on earth, yes. <laughs> uh, 
Now, this is just a fact as I see it. It's not even a point of view so much. It's just sort of an observational fact. And that's why I'd love for someone to change my mind. Um, or, or give me an example of an exception. You guys can, can you think of any of a relationship that exists or of a relationship that's valuable? Of a relationship where the relationship is not an agreement. To like what about more specifically an agreement to cover up or not have to face some kind of fundamental insecurity or fear of life. So but what about like friendships? Like what about our friendship? Like we well, friendships don't restrict each other, do they? Typically, I mean, some do. And at which point it becomes more like a relationship, like an agreement. But we don't have an agreement as friends. Right. There's just love. And if you need to do something or want to do something, you go ahead. Same for me. I'm not restricting you. You're not restricting me in order to be friends, in order to share love and have a relevant exchange in the now present moment as it spontaneously, organically appears, as there is a need for some exchange, some communication, sharing time together, whatever it is. It just happens naturally, spontaneously, and there's love. There's innocence, there is joy, there is generosity, mm -hmm. there's wanting the best for the other person, and there's just a laughter and a joy of being in each other's presence. Mm -hmm. That's pure, that's love. Show me a relationship that's not an agreement to cover up existential insecurities. And would you agree that using someone to not have to feel insecure doesn't really sound like love. Yeah, it's fucked up. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really match love, does it? So our relationships are anti-love. It's feel it's actually so true. I can just feel the obviousness of that. Underneath, it's like the whole surface level of, is just paved with everything, all the conditioning from all the movies and all the relationships. And there's so much purity and relevance in relationships and they're good. To the point where if the way that our society paints a pure relationship is to stick to the hateful agreements that you've made of limiting each other. <laughs> and if you stick to those for the rest of your life, oh my God, you're a, a deity, you're a Saint Teresa, you're the prime example of pure love. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that there's no beauty and value in learning to be so committed that you're willing to sacrifice whatever distractions might come along the way, in which case the relationship becomes a spiritual practice in essence. I think that's great. That's, that's beautiful. Cool. It's valuable. I've used it that way myself many times. To stick to a principle, to be committed to a principle, there's a beauty to that. However, at the end of the day, if your partner is truly inspired in a certain direction, shouldn't they be allowed to? Is it love to not allow it? And to then glorify when they sacrifice even the most relevant portions of because for some partners, it works. It's very rare, in my opinion. But for some partners, it works. So there's exceptions in the sense of that's their spiritual journey together. Mm -hmm. And they fully signed up for that at a soul level. And it just works for them. And yes, there's sacrifices made along the way, many probably. But the bigger thing, the bigger inspiration is that commitment on both sides, equally so. Rare, but possible. And it exists. I've, I've seen it in some cases. But, but, I'll tell you that at the end of the day, those rare examples that have established after 20, 30, 40 years, that degree of love, if, the, if at that point, the partner truly has an inspiration that feels like it's fundamental to their life, more fundamental than continuing that particular shape of commitment, then if that love truly has been love and it's been established, there would be no objection to that partner. There might be right. some challenge, there might be some catalyst, there might be some insecurity that is triggered, but if the love is truly that strong and the commitment has been truly to each other's souls and well-being, mm -hmm. and not to cover up one's own insecurity, then there would be a natural generosity there. That's my hypothesis. And if it isn't there, then it has for the most part 
been using each other as rugs to shove each other's insecurities under, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Cover, cover up, big cover up. Relationships are a cover up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm saying this not to make anyone feel bad about it, but but to kind of get what could otherwise be a super long story to try to get it across in one sentence so that people feel what I'm pointing to. Um, so I'm saying it in kind of a crude way that all relationships are basically anti-love so that people have to like, wait a second, and, or, and then try to logically, truly, objectively, as objectively as you can, try to refute this understanding. Um, and I'd be curious if someone can, I'd be very curious. But sort of, I understand this might be in people's faces a little bit, because we have so much attachment and romantic ideas about relationships as equaling love and that commitment equaling love. Um, but how could it be love? If I need you to restrict yourself in order for me to love you, how could it be love? Then all I'm in love with is the fact that you make me feel safe, which is beautiful in its own right. But it's not love for another. It's not love for the creator in the other, for the freedom in the other. It's not mm -hmm. pure love. And we don't want to destroy that illusion, because if we destroy that illusion of romanticizing relationships and agreements as being love, mm -hmm. if we start to separate those two concepts and see them for what they really are, that relationships um, are not love per se. And in fact, in most cases, they are closer to the opposite, they're abuse. They're mutually agreed upon abuse of the other, usage of the other, mm -hmm. to not have to feel a certain emotion within oneself. To me, that's not love. It's an infringement upon free will. Of course, both people agree to it, so it's no longer infringement upon free will. Mm -hmm. But but it is a, a sort of a basic violation of letting an entity be their own entity, let them be free. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've associated love with exclusivity or commitment to a particular paradigm or set of mm -hmm. parameters or limitations. And if we follow that, we we'll idolize it as true love. And if we break free from that, and we follow our, our truer inspiration, or our purpose in life, or a, a true beneficial connection with someone else, then we call that lack of love. I mean, there's a lot of nuance to that, that we could get into, um, as to why it could be pure to not act on a sexual impulse. Uh, at least in certain situations, or certain, sometimes it's just an addictive pattern for someone or whatever, there's, there's all these nuances. But nevertheless, none of these relevant nuances, or relevant exceptions, to me, none of that refutes the understanding that a relationship is an agreement to limitation, to limit one another from free movement, free speech, free thought even, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking about, huh? Were you thinking about him? Wow. Were you thinking about her? Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Were you looking, were your eyeballs glancing wow. at the boobs? Or <laughs> at the ass or at the pecs? <laughs> you like his arms? They're bigger than mine, huh? Did you notice that? Wow. <laughs> and then we call that love. And then if you refuse, if you try to control looking at someone else's pecs or like biceps, because I feel insecure about my biceps and what that means about my worth, mm -hmm. then you are devoted to love. And if, basically, if you suppress your every human impulse, and a lot of the times, if you suppress your spiritual impulses also, because a lot of our directions in life and the people that we meet has to do with our spiritual guidance, like right. where it takes us in life. Right. So if you restrict your spiritual expansion, if you restrict the knowledge of getting to know yourself at a truer intimate level and learning from all the relevant dynamics you can engage with in life, if you restrict yourself from that learning, keep yourself in a box, don't grow, don't learn, don't spiritually grow and mature, then you're <laughs> praised in the society as being pure. It's, so fucked it's up. the impurest thing you could do to each other, but we idolize it wow. in movies and so forth. And... Uh, as purity, as love. Mm -hmm. And there's so much growth to come from just 
actually relating to people purely like just the the catalyst that comes from that alone suggests that by trying to get into a relationship you're denying yourself all that growth potential so much learning we learn so much from all kinds of different mm -hmm. entities uh, why restrict that learning and sometimes it's inevitable that with learning there comes an energetic intimate connection some soul recognition some auric energetic exchange the chakras are matching and balancing each other out and boom 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 you're becoming a more balanced entity for the most part you can also digress but for the most part you're learning about yourself through relationships and mm -hmm. that's so crucial to life is learning is growth it's expansion is knowledge of who you are and why you do the things you do and why you believe the things you believe in and what is true and what's not true about you and what's your true purpose your true alignment and so forth and for the most part relationships although they claim to be pure and loving they try to restrict that mov movement of growth as much as they can and again there can be occasions where it's good to practice to have a committed relationship for a while just because you agree to a certain container maybe you know yourself like oh i get distracted too much and actually what's serving my overall spiritual growth and my alignment to my true life right now is to sort of be in a more monastic experience by being exclusive with this person. And I want to kind of go in depth with this person with no other distractions and no other processes. And I realize that with all the conditioning that we have about relationships, if I were to be free to be with other people, it would inevitably cause processes in that person and in myself. And that would distract us from the actual learning that we want to do together. So for a period of time, I agreed to be exclusive with the knowledge that probably it won't be for the rest of our lives, just so that we're clear on that. Mm -hmm. But for now, that feels great. Let's be mutually exclusive, just to have a really focused, narrow experience of learning, of growth, of expansion, of generosity, of, of becoming more loving beings, becoming freer, purer beings. And it's great. But then it's used deliberately. It's not used to cover up insecurity. It's used as a Right. as a platform, yeah. as a temporary structure or architecture to enable the most amount of growing and freedom. Then it be can become this mutually supportive type of agreement. But that's not typically what we call a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's pretty rare for a lot of relationships to even talk about their agreements. They just seem to unconsciously agree to the conditioned agreements nice and the general structure of relationships mm -hmm. and then you you only find out what the like rule was once it's broken the what was what the rule was or what the agreement oh, was yeah, once it's yeah. broken exactly yeah maybe they just watched two slightly different disney movies when right. they were six years old <laughs> and they thought they agreed to the same disney movie mm -hmm. concept exactly. but it was right. actually slightly right. different really yeah. and when you did something that didn't happen in aladdin and i did something that didn't happen yeah. to peter pen mm -hmm. uh, then uh, you betrayed me yeah <laughs> that's basically it yeah sorry right. i didn't mean to laugh like that but uh, it happened so it's ridiculous right relationships are ridiculous now deliberately designed architecture if not mm -hmm. done to cover up one's own insecurities but if done to actually accelerate self-knowledge with each other as a temporary structure, a structure that you agree will last for as long as it feels in alignment with your soul. No longer. It's not a promise for life. It's not until death do us part. Death never does us part. So <laughs> it's that way it keeps, it stays pure because you get to, at any point in your life, you get to choose that this is no longer in alignment for you. And I will love you for it. I might have my insecurities come up. I may have become dependent on our deliberately designed architecture for spiritual growth. And now at the end of two years, you decide, well, actually, no, I've met this person and it feels super relevant for me to go in that direction. I thought about it, thought about it well and hard. I've meditated on it. I've let it be as it is. It feels like I'm being really pulled in this direction. And our, our architecture no longer seems to fit me. It feels constrictive. I got to go out of this structure. Mm -hmm. I've become dependent. I've come to expect this yeah. every day because we've been conditioned. So even if you set up a deliberate architecture that's done consciously for the in the name of spiritual growth, you're still going to run into this bullshit. Mm -hmm. This conditioning is still going to come up to be seen, to, to be transmuted, to be liberated from. But um, 
But at least it's a better structure than just automatically agreeing to certain agreements of limitation. It's different than we're consciously doing this because we want each other's freedom and growth. And this seems to really fit our purpose right now and our intensity of learning. Great, by all means, do it. So what's your, what's your, like, what's the status now? I haven't been in a relationship for a while now. And I don't intend to jump into any relationship anymore for as far as I can see. Because even if let's say I would meet someone that actually, that actually makes sense for me to be with in physical proximity, in logistical cooperation of life, um, let's say like state of consciousness, and there is some kind of a valuable exchange that supports and nourish the purpose of this lifetime. And let's say I feel super good about someone that I meet. There wouldn't be the desire to be in a relationship structure with them. Um, it would just be the relevant exploration or experience for as long as that is relevant mm -hmm. to experience. So I would keep it really pure and present and be clear with that person also, that this is how I see things and how I operate. Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't get that, they, they would just be students anyway, of my dynamic with them, they wouldn't, there wouldn't be any fair exchange, if they if they haven't gotten to the state of consciousness yet, then the only way to relate with them would still be from the point of view of letting them know my point of view, knowing that that's not where they're at, and then the, we can see how that matches and how relevant that still is for them to explore spending time with me or being intimate with me, um, knowing very clearly where I stand on this, mm -hmm. knowing very clearly the nature of non agreement and non um, non limitation, to keep it pure and present at all times, to keep it about the pure love for that person and vice versa. So then it can be a training in love for someone else. Um, cool. Nice. Wow. So someone would have to really, really demonstrate in their whole beingness, a total readiness and willingness to take it and leave it as it comes, knowing me clearly knowing where I stand, for it to be interesting for me at this point to engage in any kind of relating. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy right now being absolutely not in a relationship and not being in any kind of uh, intimate agreement with anybody. I'm enjoying the solitude and the um, just a solo time, like not having not having to deal with someone's process all day long. Uh, it's <laughs> nice. Long. That's so good yeah. for you. Well, Honestly, I do it all day that. long, because if I'm getting if I get involved in something, then a lot of energy goes out to that, a lot of care. Mm -hmm. And it's only to that one person, which is worth the world. But at the same time, it does distract me from mm -hmm. my natural alignment and purpose to other things to be able to attend to many, many people, and, um, and share my love more fully there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm very hesitant to Good. engage in anything. Um, and uh, you've partly actually inspired that also, like along the way, like we've had some cool dialogues about it, where you've seen me again, be too, mm. too quickly, like there's still that romantic aspect of um, wanting to help or be of service or seeing the potential in someone and and just kind of making a mistake engaging how ready they really are for that, even though they're saying it and they're showing up for it. And then having to kind of deal with the repercussions energetically and having to clean things up and stuff. And so those kinds of processes, I just they seem so inevitable now, whenever I do mm. get in an engagement with someone, that it really, it really has to be worth it somehow, for the greater good of all things, for me to be interested in that. So yeah, I'm much less accessible than I suppose I used to be. And you've encouraged that also in me. Um, over the years, mm. in some subtle ways. And um, I think that's great. Well, we haven't really talked a lot about relationship. But I think that's people, so I think people get the picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe there can be a follow up um, 
session where people get more specific questions. Now, totally. kind of knowing where I stand on the topic, that's a great idea. The observations I've come to through this sort of arduous journey. Um, yeah, I encourage people to to ask specific questions about this, and then we can do a follow up. But at least now, sort of the foundation, perhaps, is laid. The picture is. Uh, oh, that's. So, I mean, it's so good. Just to get to this. Uh, I love that you asked people to change your mind, like get to this, like, let's see, show me a relationship that. Mm -hmm. It's not so much show me a relationship that is an exception, because there are exceptions. It's more, it's more show me, show me how a relationship, as you know it, is not an agreement of limitations for the sake of feeling safe. Nice. If you yeah. can, if you can explain that exception, I'd be happy to change my because it's not an opinion that I hold. Mm -hmm. It's just an observation that mm -hmm. I've made. So it's my current, it's not even a conclusion, but it's my current perspective on relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love I love dead end logic like this. Where you just you just get to the end. That's how it feels to me, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, it doesn't actually imply because it's not an opinion. It doesn't imply any judgment should be like I don't judge people who choose relationships. There's no sense of judgment. Like, great, good for you guys. Have enjoy your journey. Like, all the best. <laughs> Even if I see that it's disastrous setup sometimes, or like mm -hmm. it's gonna, it's gonna have an end. Doesn't mean there's no value in that. There's tons of value in making all kinds of mistakes. I make mistakes. Every time I speak, I make a mistake. Speaking is a mistake. <laughs> That's how I feel anyway. <laughs> so I can't help but teach and make mistakes and learn, right? So because the very act of teaching is a big mistake. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, like mistakes are that what life is. Yeah. Creation is one giant mistake that God made. <laughs> yeah. So it can learn about itself and get to know itself. So it's all perfect. So if you want to be in a relationship and limit each other and pretend that it's only pure love and commitment, and that it's got nothing to do with hiding your insecurities uh, from yourself using the other person. And if you want to engage in that for a while or for as long as you live, then I have no hard feelings about that. I have no judgment no stern view on that. It's just for myself, I've realized this, and it's greatly liberating. And it seems to be closer to the actual truth of the matter to me yeah. than all the other modalities and things I've tried out. So no judgment, people shouldn't judge their, themselves for still wanting a relationship and, but investigate it, like, because you can free yourself from these ideas. And I'll tell you, it's way better than having the romantic relationship of your dreams. Uh, and maybe I'm saying that because I've never quite had it, potentially. Maybe it is the best thing in the world, and it's better than any type of um, clarity <laughs> or, <laughs> or truth or freedom. Maybe yeah. it's better than freedom. I don't know. Um, but I, I've had those moments where I felt absolutely, utterly in love, and like, you're the one. I mean, embarrassingly often, I've had that yeah, feeling. Yeah, I know, I've seen it. You know, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh -huh. I just tell the people you've known me for 20 years, not for five years. <laughs> you've seen it 20 years ago, right? Not five years ago. So yeah, the freedom, I mean, the truthfulness of it, the clarity of it, and the love and the purity that is then available, that's, that's uh, untainted, that is just love. Mm. And the union, the unity consciousness that emanates from that. The purity, the freedom, the maturity, the it's just, it's priceless. Mm -hmm. And then whatever engagement happens from time to time, organically, the exchange is kept pure. Mm -hmm. Now, it just kind of depends also on the, the other person's ability to receive right. that type of purity without making stories about it, because it looks different or whatever. But at least for you, at least in your conscience, you know, for you, it was a pure experience. And you came from love, you didn't come from possession or possessiveness. And that feels so good to be able to walk away from any engagement, whether or not it ends positively, and know for sure that be 
because you were aware of it, you were acutely aware of it in each moment, you know, okay. for sure, mm -hmm. that you didn't, you may have made mistakes, so to speak, but you didn't make the mistake of not staying committed to pure love. Mm. And I feel so much better than to be in a mutually agreed upon series of limitations that pleases each other's sense of insecurity. And mm. I think this is just, you know, again, don't judge yourself, even if you recognize like, oh, there's some truth to it, but I don't kind of want to face this truth. It's a gradual, pro it's been a gradual, long, arduous journey for me. And for most people, that's what it is. <laughs> so, um, so if you see, feel some sensibility in what I'm sharing, but you don't quite want to get on board with this way of seeing yet, you don't want to expose this to yourself, because you feel it would deconstruct too many of your dreams and your hopes and your maybe your current relationship. And you wouldn't want to share this video with your partner, because they may leave you if they get mm -hmm. a hit of enlightenment. Um, and whatever other motivations might be there to keep you safe, it's okay to desire safety, it is our core desire. It is our first primary desire, if we don't feel safe, then we don't have an attention spent for any other lesson or learning or exploration. So by all means, feel safe. If you're, you're currently in a traditional relationship that makes you feel safe and stable, absolutely, that can be the most truthful thing mm. for you, even though it's objectively, maybe not the most truthful thing. If it's valid for you, if it's valuable for you, if it's serving you in your current ability to open up to greater lessons of life, and the expansion of your consciousness, and the knowing who you are and why you're here, and the dedication of yourself to your sole purpose, if you will, then it's actually the most truthful lie for you. It's actually the most truthful arrangement and mm. architecture for you. So again, no judgment, this is just an observation of the topic of relationships in general. And people really have to accept where they're at, and not try to sort of quantum leap out of this, if they don't feel ready for that. Take it one step at a time, investigate the lack of beliefs, investigate how am I using my partner to feel more safe? Oh, mm -hmm. then you feel that unsafety, like, yeah, I'm honest with myself, I kind of am doing that. Oh, but I don't want to look at it. Instead of not looking at it, just look at it one step at a time and go like, Oh, okay, now this insecurity comes up when I consider continuous observation. Now I can look at Oh, where what's the root of that insecurity? Why do I feel unsafe? Well, it's because I believe I'm this body in this alien physical harsh world. I believe I'm a person inside of a brain inside of the body that can either be loved or not loved that can be hurt or not hurt betrayed or not betrayed and so on and so forth. So you get to the root causes of why you feel insecure and vulnerable to begin with. And with awareness, those can transmute into feeling safe, feeling powerful, feeling empowered, feeling free, feeling awake, feeling pure, feeling stable, feeling strong. And then you begin to be ready to sort of really see through some of those conventional concepts in a more mm -hmm. radical way that is closer to the truth of the matter that you already know is more true, or more close closer to the truth. But again, sometimes something that's less objectively true can actually be more true or relevant for a person where they're at, it can be more helpful. So whatever is the most helpful, I would encourage, nice. but but know thyself, right? Also mm -hmm. be honest with yourself, investigate the lack of beliefs as much as you can, because it is your road to, to liberation, and it is your pathway to true, honest love, both for yourself and others. So I highly recommend moving towards some of the understandings I've shared here today. But to do to love yourself for where you're at, and to appreciate certain structures help you feel safe at this point and investigate them while you still have the structures in place. So instead of like not feeling safe at the core of your sense of self or your ego identity, and then trying to <laughs> get rid of all these structures that help you feel safe. And then you might be like swimming in shark infested waters all the time, have that feeling of unsafety, which will completely not allow you to focus on your spiritual journey, or the expansion of your consciousness. So take it at your own pace is what I'm saying. This is not an opinion you should take on. It's just general uh, investigation and observing. And um, I hope it's helpful. Mm, solid. It's like start your side hustle before you quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. Aww. Nice. Throw a little Gary Vee in there. Yeah, exactly what I thought of. <laughs> exactly. Uh. It's actually so empowering when you start to work through some of these concepts and these ideas 
and you start to feel the freedom and the things that, or without the things that you used to think you needed to feel secure and safe. Yeah. Yeah. Think, yeah. How has this been for you guys, this journey so far? The relationship journey. Um, it's so funny. Like, even if I just look back like two or three years ago, the way I saw relationships was, I mean, it's been this gradual increasing thing, but now it's like, oh my God, I couldn't, I also couldn't take a relationship seriously anymore, which is crazy because my friends, I mean, it's like everybody else outside of this community pretty much still has their sights set on the potential for finding their person and living together and having kids and that whole future. And, and the more I prioritize purity and the more access I get to just purity, just honesty, like what's actually the best thing for them, for myself, like what's actually the truest thing, the more a relationship just feels like what, like why? Why is that even like on the platter of interesting things? <laughs> it's just, it becomes like, no, I don't. It's not one of my goals. Why would a relationship be a goal or like a thing to shoot for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's weird. I've like, <laughs> I remember Janet talking about how like after a, enough work here, she's like become unemployable. So I feel like I'm like unemployable as a <laughs> wife, <laughs> oh. like a girlfriend now. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, I love it. I wish this on everyone. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. And and also just the, I can kind of understand the fear of like living, like I grew up with a family that was totally a unit and my parents are still together. And just the thought of like growing old with without a partner, like I can see that that's a genuine fear for a lot of people. But it's like, I'm good. Like right now I'm good. Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. this is the, this is the like muscle to strengthen that doesn't get weaker over time. Like this just capacity to be good and to know what I actually am without needing a person to sort of validate that or, or right. without and needing it, And it doesn't prevent you from having a relationship or right. connection, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Or even a partner like later on in life or someone right. you grow up with, or that's still all on the table as options. Right. So it's, there's nothing that limits. Right. That it's experience. like nothing is taken. It's like it, that's only a myth that it's that it's lonelier or that there's that there's limits or that there's less. Mm -hmm. It's just a. It's just if it's somehow scary from the perspective. Yeah, from that other perspective. But then once you're actually in it, like once you've actually quit your day job and moved on to the side hustle, it's like damn, this sustains me actually this <laughs> is sufficient nice. <laughs> yeah yeah and i don't think people really let go of the notion until they taste the freedom and the fulfillment in the pure i'll just call it the pure way to see love mm -hmm. pure because it's just more truthful it's more courageous it's more honest right um it's really honest with how we've been using each other as doormats to sh shove uh, shove our stuff underneath and it's honesty courage against all odds is love it's one uh -huh. of the hallmark yeah. expressions of love is that courage that no matter what i will sacrifice my lice i will sacrifice my strategies to manipulate my environment into feeling safe because of my environment it takes courage to let go of that and to see the truth of the matter which is love is love and love is freeing and love gives mm -hmm. freedom and love gives generously and love gives without expectation or limitation. And love wants, true love wants the other entity to have the most beneficial journey in this mm -hmm. lifetime. There's okay. nothing like, I, well, actually the first moment I experienced this in a profound way was with my wife, when I considered her um, having an experience with some other guy. And and, and again, at this point, I still had strong remnants of this conditioning of this primary fear of my earlier life. Mm. So it was like, oh, but this was the crucible moment for me in that regard. Also, a big step was when I really considered, like I was at that point mature enough to realize I was immature in a lot of other ways, but mature enough in this regard to want the purest. And so so I asked myself, like, yes, this hurts, this idea, the notion of it hurts. 
I feel pain when I think of it, when I consider it. There's some sense of pain for whatever reason, whatever conditioning, whatever belief. But would I really, would I feel good about myself? Would I feel aligned to my own soul and everything I stand for? If I had her limit, what makes her, what plays her strings? The analogy I used at the time is like, we are all sort of like a guitar with multiple strings. And some people uh, pluck a few of our strings and other people pluck another few mm -hmm. of our strings. And we stimulate each other in different ways. Mm -hmm. We we teach, grow and expand together in different ways. And it's very rare to find someone who fulfills every purposeful, true desire for growth and self-knowledge and self-expression in each mm -hmm. other. It's possible, but it's rare. So realizing that I wasn't fulfilling that in her, potentially, probably, and vice versa, I came to this decision that even though the pain was still there, the belief was not fully uprooted yet, because I still felt the, oh, the <laughs> constricting feeling around my heart and my solar plexus and stuff. <laughs> um, mm. I realized that what I want more is to be able to know that I let her be free. I wouldn't want to restrict her from living the fullest potential life. And so regardless of the degree of pain and insecurity and belief systems I'll have to face if it happens, I would much rather face it all than know that I restricted her freedom in some way, like that would hurt so much more. Mm. So that was sort of a threshold for me. And then I just sort of quantum leaped from that point on. I was like, fuck it, I don't care about my pain. I don't care about my insecurities. I don't care about anything I have to face. I don't care about feeling shit for five years in a row if I have to. Purity, that's where it's fucking at. Wow. Mm. True love, courage is where it's fucking at. And that's what I want to be. Mm. So that's what I stand for. Mm. And quite instantly, quite instantly, I was okay with it. It just kind wow. of quantum leaped out of that sort of remnant I still had left from that primary fear that I had cultivated for so long. Yeah, courage is totally where it's at. I used to, when I grew up, I actually felt really lucky that my parents had split up and become divorced. Um, because I could see my friend's parents that obviously didn't have this true cohesiveness. It didn't feel authentic and it felt like a lot of marriages or traditional relationships were this preservation of a structure. And it just didn't feel true to me. And I just really admired my parents' courage to go against the norm and to really go in pursuit of what was the best for them and what mm. made them happy as individuals. And I feel that that's, that's it. Like it's, you're either devoted mm -hmm. to your own soul and your own expansion, or you're devoted to the illusion or um, putting a condition on yourself. And I just wouldn't wish that for anyone. Yeah, It's, it's actually really tragic. <laughs> but I've been there. Um, I've also chosen to be in a relationship where um, I felt that the other person was restricting me. And, or it wasn't even that person, it was their insecurities and their fears um, of me you know, looking at that other person or like being into someone else. And it really hurts. It just, these conditions go like the condition of an agreed relationship really goes against like the very nature of love, yes. which is unconditional. Mm. And I liked what you said earlier as well, Bentinho, about how we have so many different needs and it's very rare that like one person can fulfill those needs. Like we got the emotional needs, physical, spiritual. And when you don't have such a fixed construct of like this one person, then you can allow these other types of connections or friendships that fulfill say your spiritual needs or your emotional needs. And then this one person, um, you probably won't have so many frustrations with them because you'll recognize, okay, they fulfill me in this way and we work in this way, but uh, you're not going to um, have this unfulfilled need mm. um, within them because you're able to receive that energy from another person. Nice. And then your desire to change them. Exactly. To be able to pluck all your strings also like diminishes or 
disappears, mm -hmm. because now you can see them in their true light, you can respect who they are and what they can offer you. Yeah. And you can sort of have a much more respectful exchange in that way and let them be who they are. Mm. Because you're not, you know, but I'm committed to you because I'm so devotional and I'm so loving and I, I stick to our agreements, but you won't fulfill me in this and this and that way. So it's like this really self-destructive thing, mm -hmm. relationships most of the time, because you're trying to force each other to be able to play the instrument perfectly, each mm -hmm. other. And we're such a complex, multidimensional yeah. being. Um, of course, we're going to be tempted when we meet other people and other connections. This creation is filled with unity. It is unity. Mm -hmm. And it wants to learn from itself in all mm -hmm. these multiple ways. Um, by the way, I'm not a big proponent of the sort of free love movement of like, oh, let's just go around and fuck everybody mm -hmm. and like free love, man. And like that has such a kind of fake compensating mm -hmm. nature to it as well. I'm really suggesting a very balanced, self-aware approach here where we just understand the truth of the matter is that there is only one being ultimately. And we're all stimulating each other and learning from each other in different ways. Freedom is the hallmark of courage and love. There is no unconditional love, as Anurag said, because there is no conditional love. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. It's either loving or it's not nice. based in love. It's either based mm -hmm. in love or fear. There is no conditional love. So it's just a fact we ha at some point have to face if we want to claim that we're all about love. But so many people claim that they, or we can just say, we claim that we're about love so often when we're just about safety and we're not wanting to see that. We're not wanting to mm -hmm. expose that strategy in ourselves. And then we go off the bent wagon in other ways. <laughs> like we join free love communities where everyone has tantric sex with each other and like <laughs> it's all like over the top and chocolatey and roses and flowers <laughs> and bathtubs and massages. And like and we idolize that, you know, you get this whole imbalanced other approach. Mm -hmm. Um, which is still a, a personality fetish quirk distortion. It's not mm -hmm. that true balanced approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to give off the impression that I recommend everyone just goes about and is intimate with whoever it feels good with in the moment. Um, it's a balanced approach and it requires you to know yourself, but just approach every connection that you have with respect and freedom to the best of your current ability and let each other be who you are, let each other be free. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I can only say this because I've made a lot of mistakes. So it's definitely not a holier than thou type of suggestion. And if it's relevant for you and a particular being to have an agreement for both of your growth and your transformation, it's almost like you don't have to make an agreement, the energy just speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's just a given, there's no nice. need to decided it's going to be this way right so if you just allow it to be truthful and allow the natural freedom to happen there actually there can become an even stronger bond um just organically and naturally with the energy that's there between two people mm -hmm. to the point i would say where ultimately like you've become so pure in your intention with them that you no longer need them mm -hmm. you no longer need them to do or be or change and you see God in them, you see the true mm. reality in them. So you're relating to them now as the mm. creator, as the one infinite being, as God. And that's sort of the pinnacle of love is for God to recognize its own fundamental inseparable unity and presence from one point of view in another point of view, from one being to another being, to see the unity, to know the unity, is that pinnacle of love and we just can't really glimpse that. We can, it's possible within a structure. But you'll find that in those moments where that is experienced, all thought of structure falls away for that moment. Mm -hmm. But the pinnacle of relationship is that the relationship disappears. And there's just the creator looking at itself, marveling at itself, knowing itself, being in bliss in the presence of recognizing itself. And at some point, that's all you want. Mm -hmm. you wouldn't want it any other way. And then you found your safety in God, you found your safety in the reality, not in the illusion. And therefore, you're unshakable, you're safe. And this is a gradual process for most. So take it easy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any homework for the people? Haha. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm.
get divorced before the end of the week. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, okay. Homework, let's see. Good one. We said we were going to give some homework at the end of these mm -hmm. sessions. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, just maybe replay this again, because the first time you hear it, especially if it's a new information or new perspective, you're going to have a mixed bag of feelings about it. You're going to have some resistances, some fears, some self-deceiving layers come up that like try to justify their room. And again, no judgment, just take it easy. You don't have to jump on board with anything I'm saying here. I don't need you to, I don't want you to. Just sharing my perspective. Um, but if you are interested, if something about it rings true, just watch this once or twice more in a, in a couple of days or so. Give yourself a break, like look at your fundamental insecurity beliefs. Like, why do you believe you're insecure, that you're vulnerable, that you're lonely, that you're not good enough by yourself, that you're not loved if somebody doesn't give you affection, those kinds of things. If you can look at those beliefs and really identify them clearly as beliefs, as statements in your mind, sentences in your mind, then you can begin to see how they're not true. And anytime a belief is identified, and seen as nonsensical, as something that doesn't make sense, as nonsense, all beliefs ultimately are nonsense, depending on the level of consciousness that the higher in consciousness you go, the less the beliefs below that level make any sense to you, they no longer are relevant for you, they no longer are needed as a structure to support your sense of safety and well being and, and who you are. So understand that this is a process of uprooting those beliefs, identifying them, understanding them until they seem nonsensical to you. And you cannot believe in something that makes no sense to you. So all you have to do is identify the belief and look at it, investigate it, accept it, and see if you can understand the belief to the point where you're beyond the belief and it makes no more sense for you. And then you, the belief is no longer a belief because you can't believe in that which makes no sense to your consciousness. So that'd be my homework in general, that would be my homework for almost all things. <laughs> but especially nice. also with this topic, that'd be my suggestion. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sharing your experiences. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks. Loved it. Cool. Ding, da, da, ding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinomasaro.tv. Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on bentinomasaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinhoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. It's eight long-form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online global enlightenment retreat at BentinhoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 